Hi, I'm Professor San San Lim. I'm Professor of Communication and Technology at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Can you please tell us more about yourself and your work? I'm a professor of communication and technology. And for the past 17 years, I have been conducting research on the social impact of technology, specifically on how families and young people incorporate technology into their everyday lives. I'm fascinated by how the technology interrupts or interacts with their family relationships, but also the ways in which um, their family relationships can be enriched and also um, uh, the implications this has for digital literacy as a whole. My uh, passion really is about um, having a deeper understanding with how people engage with technology so that we can better design technology to be more empathetic to people's lifestyles, norms and needs. What are the challenges in raising and teaching children in this digital age? The families that I have spoken to always feel that technology is definitely here to stay. And they recognize that technology can bring many benefits, but they also realize that there are certain risks that technology will introduce into the home. So for example, your child may be exposed to age inappropriate content or distressing content that they may not have the maturity to deal with. And so parents have to be ready and prepared to provide the child with the support and guidance to ensure that their children are accessing um, the internet and different kinds of technology in beneficial ways. Yet at the same time, even as families can recognize the benefits and virtues of technology, they also don't feel that they necessarily have the skills or the expertise or the knowledge to guide their children. And many parents I have spoken to feel quite daunted about the process of having to keep up with technological changes so that they can provide their children with the right kind of support and guidance. And this is um, an ongoing struggle that many families go through every day in our technologizing world. How do these parents deal with um, this technological gap where they are aware that they don't know everything, but they need to know it to help their child? So I know many parents um, find it to be quite a struggle and quite a challenge and many of them um, will put in some effort and they will, for example, go onto parenting websites or media literacy websites to get advice. They will also, for example, follow blogs of um, parenting blogs that provide the tips and tricks for certain new technological trends that they should be aware of. They consult with friends and um, family who have children of an equivalent age so that they can compare notes. And generally, they keep up with the news so that they know what kinds of technological changes are afoot that require them to step in and provide their children with guidance. Um, it's not an easy task. It involves quite a big uh, effort and investment of time and energy. And I know many parents find it difficult, but nevertheless, something that they feel they must do. But many parents have um, admitted to me that they don't feel that they are doing the best job that they can in terms of keeping up, but they nevertheless do try. Is the digitalization widening the digital divide in Asia? Yes, in many ways, um, the digital divide will replicate the socioeconomic divide, right? So um, lower income families will have less access to technology, less access to the internet. And that means that their quality of um, technological engagement may be poorer. They may be using technology, but perhaps not for educational purposes or not for upskilling. And this can disadvantage them in the workplace when they are seeking employment. And so um, in the case of higher income families, obviously they have not only the access to these resources, but they also have slightly more time flexibility, slightly uh, higher competencies to make the most out of digitalization. So I think digitalization generally and the divides that it introduces will in many ways exacerbate the socioeconomic divides that we already see in our society. What are further implications of this widening social economic divide? Clearly, I think it is something that requires closer state uh, support and state intervention in the form of 
um, for example, universal digital access policies that provide everyone with access to digital devices. And not only that, more importantly, also to digital literacy training so that everyone can be equally adept and equally well equipped to flourish in a digitalizing world. And this has important implications because a lot of jobs will become digitalized and it will require digital skills. And if we do not equip the vast majority of the workforce with these digital skills, we will find that most of the best opportunities will go to the most educated and the most well-resourced among us. And it will lead to an overall um, uh, decline in the quality of work that the vast majority of populations can access. Do you maybe have some examples about Singapore or around Asia Pacific about best practice examples? For example, in um, Singapore, we have skills um, upgrading programs and these are subsidized by the state. And we also have a digital ambassadors skills program where we have people who go to neighborhoods in order to provide um, skills training to people who want to learn more about digital skills. And um, also we have various agencies such as the Media Literacy Council or the National Library or the Infocom and Media Development Authority that um, have introduced all kinds of digital digitalization programs where people not only um, can digitalize, for example, their businesses and their business practices, but they can also use these programs to enhance and improve their digital skills. As a member of parliament, you advocated for the digital rights of children. Can you please tell us more about that? So, um, like all online users, um, children will go online to use the internet for various activities, whether it is entertainment, whether it is uh, learning, and so on. And as they use the internet um, inadvertently, some information about them will be captured by certain online portals and so on. And it's important that children understand the implications of using these services. And it's important that children understand what rights they have to individual privacy. And um, unless we ensure that companies targeting children are more transparent about explaining to children what rights they have when they use their services, you may find children um, having their information exploited and used against them. For, so, for example, if you think about a website that provides um, fun videos for children, if that website is using the information they get from their ch child users to market more activities to them or market more products to them, the children may unwittingly become more vulnerable to this kind of um, very pointed, very targeted advertising. And this is something that um, all corporations that are marketing to children should be more responsible about, that they should not be harvesting data on children and using the, the data to market children, uh, uh, to children and target them in very deliberate ways. You have been studying the digitalization of education and the social impact of technology for a while. What has changed with COVID-19? So in the wake of COVID-19, we saw many families sequestered at home and um, many schools transitioned towards online classes. And this was in many ways a good thing because even though children could not go to school, they could still continue with their learning, interacting with their classmates and their teachers. But it also meant that parents became sort of substitute teachers because parents had to step up to assist their children with these online platforms. And not all children are equally adept at using these platforms. So in many ways, it made parents more involved in the children's learning, um, although this has both positive and negative dimensions. Speaking about the social implications of technology domestication in micro settings, um, such as homes and workplaces, what has been the impact of COVID-19? Obviously, you know, our homes are designed for us to rest, for us to interact. 
uh, for us to engage in um, leisure activities, but they're not necessarily designed for us to be learning as well as working and doing all of these other things all at the same time, all under one roof. And COVID-19 really resulted in great pressure within the house where you had children, for example, all going online, sometimes fighting over scarce resources like devices or space or even the bandwidth in order to access their lessons. While at the same time, parents, both parents in many cases, were also trying to engage in their work from home obligations, whether it was conferencing with a colleague or whether it was phoning a client or even just doing their day-to-day -day online um, activities. So mm -hmm. this meant that there was um, great tension in the household because there was that um, situation of scarce resources and at the same time um, people were bumping up against each other in confined spaces and each person was trying to get his or her thing done but not necessarily to a level of satisfaction that they're used to. Asia has been hit by the pandemic first and switched to e-learning much earlier than on other regions such as Europe. Are there any lessons learned um, from Asia for Europe and the Western world? Generally, Asia is a very techno technologically optimistic region. You know, people embrace technology quite readily. And because of that embrace of technology, the transition from offline to online was quite easy because many people had devices. Many people also were familiar with using these devices. But I think one important lesson to learn from the ex Asian experience is that even very connected cities like Singapore, Hong Kong, or um, Taiwan and um, cities in Korea, for example, even these cities experience digital exclusion because you may have people who have devices, but sometimes they may have the wrong kinds of devices that may not be that um, amenable for learning. And at the same time, you could also have people who use devices, but use devices in a very superficial manner or particularly for maybe more leisure purposes. And they don't necessarily have the skills to use these devices for learning and other kinds of uh, more instrumental purposes like upskilling. So that means that um, even if we have connected cities, we have to think about making digital inclusion as encompassing as possible in terms of having everyone not only have the access to the devices, the, but also the right kinds of devices, access to the internet, as well as access to the skills and competencies that they need to harness the most and the best that they can from the internet. How did it affect families that schools had to switch to e-learning? In the case of families, you would have families where parents have um, the luxury of time as well as the privilege of competencies in order to guide their children with online learning. But um, clearly there will be parents who are less well resourced, they may be more time pressed, they may not even be at home for their children. Some of them cannot work from home. And many parents who are in blue collar professions, for example, may not also have had prior experience with technology the way perhaps white collar parents would have. And so this means that these parents are less advantaged in terms of providing their children with the support and the guidance that their children need when it comes to online learning. How does it affect women and gender relations in the family in particular? We still see women bear a disproportionate share of the child caring burden. And um, obviously in the case of children's education, Mothers play a very important role, not just in terms of um, ensuring the day-to-day -day management of the child's um, school-related tasks, but they also feel very often duty-bound to ensure that the child is uh, meeting their developmental milestones. They also feel as if they've got to provide a very nourishing home environment for the child in terms of you know, proper diet, proper life habits, as well as um, uh, the right sort of educational support materials. And so in the wake of COVID-19, um, we saw more parents working from home. And so women who are juggling work and the home um, now have to do it all under one roof within the house. And I think the pressure of 
to performing both your professional duties and your home obligations um, under one roof became quite stressful for many women as many media reports and surveys reveal. Do you think that actually this pandemic accelerated the use of technology within education? I think, you know, um, many universities were already experimenting with, for example, massively online open courses. And some of us were also um, experimenting with um, hybrid learning, uh, mixed reality type uh, learning models. But we never avidly um, mounted it on as large a scale as we have today. But by dint of circumstance, circumstance many of us have actually um, embraced these technologies and you know, jumped uh, very deeply and very intensively into using these digital um, educational platforms. What do you anticipate for the future of learning and what should our societies prepare for? At the moment, it seems to be all digital because of the pandemic. But um, clearly, I think the pandemic has been able to demonstrate not only the virtues of digital learning methods, but it has also managed to underline for us what it is we treasure about face-to-face -face learning. And I think the future will see us um, marry the two forms of learning and teaching in more strategic ways so that we can distill the best of digital learning as well as the uh, most um, beneficial aspects of face-to-face -face learning. What are some advantages and disadvantages of e-learning? Online learning actually has many virtues. In the first instance, um, students have greater control over the content that they're consuming. If they watch a lecture and there are aspects of the lecture that they find confusing or unable to process quickly, they can always review the lecture um, as many times as they like. With online quizzes also, they can take the quizzes repeatedly and practice until they are satisfied. Um, some online methods can also be very entertaining and very stimulating if they are, you know, sort of gamified in a certain way. And so this can actually stimulate students' interest in a topic. In the more dynamic online learning situation, like online tutorials and online discussions, I have noticed that my students who are a little bit more withdrawn or a little bit um, shy in face-to-face -face situations are more confident about speaking up and they are less conscious of the uh, power dynamics between students. And so they become more participatory. So these are all some very positive uh, benefits to online learning. Some of the disadvantages would obviously be that um, it requires a lot of discipline on the part of the learner. If you don't maintain that um, routine of learning and watching the online videos, and if you don't put in effort to participate, you can end up being quite invisible in the classroom. And if you are invisible and you're inactive, you won't benefit as much. At the same time, um, the online environment also requires quite a lot of concentration on the part of the student. The online setting is not necessarily something that comes naturally to us. And so sometimes we may find ourselves with our minds wandering and um, the whole business of seeing you know many of your classmates faces on zoom for example has also been found to be quite a cognitive drain on people and that also can undermine your ability to concentrate what will the classroom of the future look like so um, I think the classroom of the future will be quite an exciting one. Um, I imagine, for example, a very open space where students can move freely to interact with each other, but with the support of technological tools that provide you with mixed reality or hybrid reality uh, devices that allow us to um, create simulations of certain scenarios of, for example, wicked problems that students should be working collaboratively to solve. And ideally, the classroom of the future should also be one that's interdisciplinary in nature, where students aren't just necessarily taught by instructors of one discipline, but by instructors with multiple disciplines and multiple bodies of knowledge and expertise. And through this collective sharing of wisdom, there will be a much more collaborative effort in order to find solutions to the difficult problems that our society is confronting today.
What's the new normal for the edtech industry? The new normal for the educational technology industry is to provide services for education from end to end. I think in the past, um, many of the services might have been on, for example, um, tracking students' progress or on for example, providing content to students. Now we're seeing many more innovations in terms of creating dynamic learning environments. We're also seeing more innovations in the assessment space because students are doing tests and taking exams and having their work assessed online. So there are also more innovations in that space with regard to um, how we can assess and monitor students' performance, not through direct face-to-face -face methods. So I would say the new normal in educational technology is to really look at educational technology in virtually every aspect of education. What are your predictions for the next one to two years within the edtech industry? Within the edtech industry, um, there should actually be greater differentiation in terms of providing access not just um, for educational technology services that cater to very digitalized and very connected societies or groups, but also to think about how to make ed tech more inclusive so that even students who are more poorly resourced um, can also access educational technology. In other words, I would say that as the pandemic wears on and we see more social uh, divisions and we also see some challenges within certain pockets of our community uh, to communities to access education, that there needs to be more inclusive innovations by the ed tech industry so that students of all needs and across all socioeconomic uh, levels can access education, pandemic or otherwise. Do you think that this pandemic had an impact on how we will all use technology in the future? Yes, for sure. I think the pandemic made us use technology in ways that we had never thought possible. It also made us use technology for many aspects of our lives where we never thought technology had a role. And by that, I mean even, for example, um, for leisure, for exercise, many people previously had never conceived of, for example, visiting an online museum or watching a streamed movie online with friends around the world. But it's been able to broaden our imaginations as to how we can use technology, not just professionally, but also socially and personally. So I would say that it's made people more open in terms of considering what roles technology can play, but it's also made people more um, circumspect and thoughtful and reflective about our reliance on technology and whether we want to be as reliant on technology as we currently are. So um, hopefully when the pandemic passes, I think we will see people um, find it striking a greater balance between their technology use and their um, parts of their lives where technology may not um, play such an important role. So I think it is inevitable that in a digitalizing world, we will use technology significantly and that we will have a love-hate relationship with our technology because it brings a lot of benefits, but it also you know, um, brings us uh, a lot of obligations. And I think it's important that people understand the effects that media and technology have on them and um, take control of how the technology is incorporated into their lives and learn to manage the role that it plays so that it doesn't consume them.